The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I truly appreciate this hearing. I think it's incredibly important. Um, I think before we begin, just to be clear, the people that we're talking about that attack the Capitol live within our borders. Uh, some of them are coming from our neighborhoods and our communities across the country, and that's why this is, hearing is so incredibly important. I also want to repeat, uh, as I continue to repeat over and over again, that immediately after the aftermath of this attack, um, you know, I hear people talking about new surveillance powers, talking about the possibility of, of increasing national security powers and those kinds of things. It is incredibly important that no matter the intention, history shows us that every time we give our government new powers in this area, they are inevitably used to target people that look like me, oppressed people of color, and minority groups across our country, not those that attacked our capital. Director Ray, in your testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee, you stated, and I quote, the attack, the siege was, a cr was criminal behavior, plain and simple, and it's behavior that we, the FBI, view as domestic, domestic terrorism. Is that correct? Sounds like a, a correct quote of what I said in front sure. of Senate Judiciary. So some of my colleagues, Director, it, are, are calling the January 6th, you know, some of them d just look away and are calling them uh, normal tourist visits or activities to the Capitol. Uh, did you hear that false description before? Uh, I, I have been asked about that and I, I wouldn't describe it that way. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that's how, you know, again, January 6th attacks have been described in the past, and it's really to, to downplay, excuse, and otherwise defend this really um, violent attempt to overthrow our democracy and the Constitution itself. Um, by doing that, I very much believe colleagues are endorsing those actions. Director Ray, what would happen if you do not hold those account, those that were responsible for January 6th accountable? What, what do you think would happen? Well, Congresswoman, I, I, you know, I think it's one of the things that defines our country is a respect for the rule of law. And uh, there is a right way and a wrong way to express your unhappiness, your anger, your disagreement under the First Amendment. And that does not include violence against law enforcement, destruction of federal property, and the kind of behavior that we saw in this Capitol on January 6th. Uh, and so, uh, to me, the rule of law is at stake, uh, and that's what we're trying to make sure that we enforce. The ends do not justify the means, no matter how think, much do, people... Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you think, um, Director Ray, that it would enable people to continue those efforts, that it would enable what we would some refer to white supremacist groups, uh, domestic terrorist groups here, do you think it would enable them to continue to attack our capital and our democracy if we did not hold them accountable? I think if, if the criminal laws are not uh, fairly and aggressively enforced uh, and if domestic terrorism is not fairly and aggressively pursued, then I think it will not only continue but grow. In March of this year, I don't know if folks on the panel know, but the Director of National Intelligence released an unclassified report titled, quote, Domestic Violent Extreme extremism poses heightened threat in 2021. The report identified the quote, uh, quote, emboldening impact of violent breach of the U.S. Capitol as a development that would, quote, almost certainly sp spur domestic violent extremists to try, in, to try to engage in violence this year. Director Ray, yes or no, do you agree with DNI's assessment? Uh, yes, we contributed to that assessment uh, and share it. Do you believe Director, that continued attempts to discredit the November election, such as the absurd Arizona recount and recent reports that the former president believes that he will be reinstated. He still says this could potentially have similar effects. Uh, well, certainly I think there's a whole range of things out there that are contributing. Uh, you know, well, as do you I've think said, it enables that narrative that pit folks had a right to come here, they had a right to come here and attack our capital and our democracy? You know, I, I, I've tried to steer clear of weighing in on different sure. people's speech. Uh, just because of my role, I certainly I understand. understand why you're asking. Director Ray, it's really scary to believe, because I truly believe this. Do you think if the people in that crowd looked brown or black majority, do you think that we would be here in this hearing right now? You know, it's... <laughs> 
that's hard for me to say. We, I can tell you, we FBI. Do you think? Do you think, do you think the standard. riot gear would have showed up? Do you think? Do you think the National Guard would have been called? Because what I, I, I really saw can't. when Black Lives Matter protesters were here and those defending their right to choose, it seemed like all of a sudden all of y'all had resources. Y'all had a plan then. Why is it when white supremacist terrorists show up here to want to lynch the vice president, to attack the speaker, to attack our democracy, threatening the lives of members of Congress, really the lives of just our whole livelihood in our country, that no one seemed to want to show up? Well, Congressman, I can only really speak to the FBI's role. And my view is we have one standard, and we've tried to apply it consistently in both situations. Thank you, I yield. The gentleman, the gentlelady's time has expired. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it? According to investigators, they insist he was intentionally targeting white military looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black on white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals, no matter what color they are? When you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong. But that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th. Everybody has said it was a tragic day. It never should have yep. happened. They wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson. He looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police but they don't talk about any of that. And you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did that. Last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th th there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th 
is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day to day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure, it does in certain areas. But is the is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.